Hello once again. Welcome to our weekly teachings on the books of the Bible. Tonight, we are talking about the book of Leviticus, which is the book of laws. Last week, uh, we spoke about the book of Exodus. But before we get into the teaching, I to pray that the Spirit of God will continue to do work in us and to prepare us for what he is saying through his word and uh, we are receptive in our hearts to hear exactly what he is saying so we release this meeting right now the teachings may the holy spirit minister to us and bring the word to life so last time we saw how god delivered the children of israel out of the captivity in egypt using moses and Aaron. In our journey through the books of the Bible, we'll be looking at the book of Exodus from chapter 16 through 40 to the end, and the book of Leviticus in this teaching. While the majority of the chapters we're covering deal with God revealing his laws, building the tabernacle, and the requirements of how to worship and sacrifice to him, the reports of the children of Israel reveal continued murmurings and complaints against Moses, Aaron, and effectively against God, despite what had been accomplished in the deliverance from Pharaoh. What do we know about the authorship and timing of the book of Leviticus? So Leviticus is the third book of the Pentateuch, and as part of the Pentateuch, is closely associated with the book of Exodus with the same theories of authorship. Either a biblical theory of Moses or modern contemporary theory of later editors, and the timing with, between 1450 BC with Moses as the author or the much later date associated with the theory of the editors. However, both Jesus and Paul refer to passages in the book of Leviticus as Moses wrote, as we see in Mark 1.44 and Romans 10.5. So here we're assuming that um, Moses was indeed the author of the book of Leviticus. The name Leviticus itself comes from the Latin Leviticus, referring to the priestly tribe of Levi. Leviticus instructs the Israelites and their priestly mediators about their access to God by means of atoning blood, and to make clear God's standard of holy living for his chosen people. Leviticus covers the instructions God gave to Moses in the approximately two months between the completion of the tabernacle and the departure from Mount Sinai. So after this introduction, let us go back to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 22, where the children of Israel have celebrated the victory after Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. So Moses had told the children of Israel that God's name was I am that I am, or Yahweh and that he was delivering them from slavery. But they knew little more than that. They didn't know where they were going, what God wanted from them, or what his intentions were for them. So as they walked away from the Red Sea into the wilderness, the first few months of their journey were filled with turmoil. The Israelites complained about lacking food and water, and then when God miraculously provided fresh water and rain bread or manna from heaven, they complained about the monotony of their diet. At one point, they even got so upset they wanted Moses dead. But then they arrived at the base of Mount Sinai and discovered that God had chosen this place to reveal himself to his people and enter into a covenant with them. Moses went up the mountain to meet with God and God immediately explained his intention for Israel. In Exodus 19, 3-6 we read, Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourself have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God was using this moment at Mount Sinai to identify himself to his people and to tell them about their new identity. They could now rest in the security of being treasured and protected by God. It was also here that God would set the terms for how their relationship would work. Before they could be begin this process, however, the people of Israel had to prepare themselves. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. I'll let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take 
care not to go up into the mountain of or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. At Sinai, God entered into a covenant with Moses and the rest of the Israelites that built upon the covenant he had made with Abraham. As they waited at the base of Mount Sinai, Israel learned that they were the great nation that God had promised to Abraham. They were the ones who would inherit the land of Canaan, and ultimately their responsibility was to be a blessing to all the nations. The implications of this covenant were clear. The Lord would be Israel's God and Israel would be his people. As we might anticipate, however, there were some potential problems with the Holy God binding himself to sinful people. How could this sinless God maintain a relationship with people who are prone to rebel and do the things that he hates? Israel would need to know what God expected of them and what it looked like to live as the people of God. This is where the Old Testament law came in. Unlike the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses included an extensive code of conduct. This law spelled out God's expectations for his people in their civil, religious and moral lives. The law starts with what are known as the Ten Commandments, which we find in Exodus chapter 20, which begins in verse 1. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither shall your son or daughter, nor your male or your female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your, you may live long in the land and the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The law began with the Ten Commandments, but from these ten simple laws followed more than 100 specific laws related to all aspects of the life of the people of God. These laws were legally binding on the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Exodus 24, 7 reads, Then he, Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. God then gave Moses instructions on the construction of the tabernacle where God would meet with his people and on the clothing and consecration of the priests. The whole law was set up to teach the children to fear, that is, reverence God, and to build the children of Israel into a unique nation that would keep it together no matter what happened. And yet even as God was given instructions to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai, the Israelites rebelled again, making a golden calf idol, which we read in Exodus chapter 32. The Israelites were out of Egypt, but Egypt was not out of the Israelites. It's a warning to us even today that God can deliver us from the consequences of sin, but unless we are born again, the flesh in us will take us right back into bondage. There is nothing in the law that tells the Israelites that they will receive ultimate salvation, 
if they perfectly keep every aspect of the law. In fact, the law itself assumes that the Israelites will fail in keeping it. That's why the sacrificial system was included. The law does promise blessing for obedience and a curse for disobedience, but this is not the same thing as salvation by works. Even now God blesses us for obedience and we suffer consequences when we rebel against him. In reality, the law was never intended to give the Israelites a moral ladder they could climb and thereby earn God's favour by showing what good people they were. Instead, the law was about maintaining a relationship with God. The law solved the problem of how a holy God can bind himself to a sinful people. It gave the people of Israel a tangible code of conduct that would allow them to faithfully live out their identity as the people of God. It taught them to relate to God and one another appropriately. The law was not a system of salvation through good works. While the covenant with Moses was an extension of God's covenant with Abraham, there was an important difference between the two. With Abraham, the covenant was unconditional. In other words, God was making a promise to Abraham that was not dependent upon Abraham's actions. God would fulfill this covenant no matter what Abraham did or didn't do. With Moses, however, God added a conditional element. God would bless Israel, bring them safely into the promised land, bless them in the land, and make them a blessing to the rest of the nations if they were faithful to observe God's law. God would always keep his promise to Abraham, but the promises he made at Mount Sinai to bless Israel were dependent on faithful obedience. These blessings were not dependent on Israel's sinless perfection, but God required the Israelites to faithfully uphold their end of the covenant. If they did, they would be blessed and receive the promise. If they didn't, they would be cursed and taken into exile. But God's covenant with Moses promised blessings for Israel, there was more at stake than the well-being of a single nation. Just as God promised to bless Abraham so that he would be a blessing to all families of the earth, God intended his covenant with Israel to be a blessing to every nation. In Exodus 19.5-6, God told Israel that they were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These two titles are extremely important for understanding Israel's calling. A priest has two responsibilities, to represent a holy God to sinful people and to represent a sinful people to a holy God. As a kingdom of priests, Israel was meant to represent their God to the nations around them. Collectively, they were to show the world who their God was and what he demanded of the world. On the other side, God meant Israel to represent these nations to himself. In other words, they were to pray on behalf of the people around them, asking God to bless them. These concepts are also present in the title, Holy Nation. They were meant to stand out, to be clearly different from other nations. They were set apart for God's purposes. They were to minister on God's behalf to show the holy character of God to the world around them and to be a light to the nations. Leviticus 27 says, Consecrate yourself and be holy because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Since the fall, human beings are incapable of living sinless lives and enjoying God's presence on the basis of their own moral purity. But God made a way to deal with that through sacrifice. The sacrificial method isn't fully developed or explained until we get to the book of Leviticus. But the unfolding story of the Old Testament does point to sacrifices being made prior to this point. We see occasional sacrifices through the first part of the Old Testament, but it wasn't until God gave the law to Moses that animal sacrifices became an integral part of the life of Israel. The law encompassed many things. It dictated their civil life and government, their moral behavior and their religious and ceremonial practices. The law was specific about when to sacrifice, what to sacrifice and how to sacrifice. There were a variety of sacrifices or burnt offerings and each type of offering served a different function. But in general, these sacrifices were designed to show gratitude to God to demonstrate a contrite heart before God and to atone for sin. That word atone or atonement is significant theologically. Essentially, atonement is all about reconciling, making amends for what has gone wrong and re-establishing peace where there was once conflict. Atonement allowed people who were distanced from God because of their sin to once again enjoy being at one with God. So in addition to providing avenues for expressing love and gratitude for God, the law of Moses gave the Israelites specific instructions for making atonement for sin. Animal sacrifices gave the Israelites a tangible way of showing their sorrow 
and desire to have their relationship with God restored. Sacrifices also provided a substitute that could be offered in Israel's place. One of the most striking features of the Old Testament law is the blood in sacrifices. It's because blood was necessary for an effective sacrifice. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Leviticus 17 and 11. Ancient Israel was prone to sin. On a regular basis, they were required to bring the appropriate sacrifices in order to make atonement for their sin and restore peace with God. Every time a sacrifice was offered, which was often, an animal would die. It would be a graphic representation of what sin requires and that a lamb, goat or bull died in place of the sinner. Even though we don't need to make animal sacrifices for sin today, this Old Testament practice still gives us a vivid picture of the seriousness of sin. We've already raised the question, how can sinful humans live in proximity to a holy God? The answer is found in the sacrificial system generally. But there's one event in the middle of Leviticus that cuts to the heart of this question. It's known as Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, an event still celebrated in Israel today or by Jews around the world. Every year the Israelites would celebrate the Day of Atonement and God would atone for his people's sins and enable them to dwell with him. As we read through Leviticus 16, it's clear that God takes his worship very seriously. The chapter begins as God gave Aaron, Moses' brother, and the first high priest, very specific instructions on how to enter his presence. The rest of his chapter of the chapter describes what is supposed to happen on the Day of Atonement. On this one day out of the entire year, one man out of all the Israelites, the high priest, was allowed to enter the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and stand before God on behalf of the people. The high priest was to take with him the blood of a spotless animal. First he was to sacrifice a bull as an offering to atone for his own sins, because he could not come into the presence of God on his own accord. Then the high priest would offer two goats. The first goat would be sacrificed and its blood would be smeared on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. This blood satisfied the wrath of God because a substitute was offered in place of the people who deserved his wrath. So instead of seeing the law that was broken, God looked down and saw the blood of atonement. Essentially, this sacrifice died in place of the entire community of God's people. The priest would then take the second goat, symbolically lay his hands on the head of the goat to represent the sins of the people being transferred to this animal, and then release that goat, which is where we get the phrase the scapegoat, to bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. The sins of God's people were being removed, carried off to a remote location, never to visit them again. Their guilt and condemnation were gone. Yet this ceremony was to be repeated every year because Israel would not stop sinning. Sin is not an external problem. It runs through the core of each of us and continually manif manifests itself in a variety of ways. Dealing with sin was therefore an important and familiar part of the everyday life of the Israelites. Now, Leviticus uh, 23 outlines the feasts to be observed by Israel. The later feasts of dedication and Purim were added later, but when the nation was to come together to worship God, there were the feasts of Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits. And these three have since been combined into the, uh, the united celebration of Passover. And then there was Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, followed by the Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. As the rest of the Old Testament unfolds, we find that Israel was largely unfaithful to the command of Exodus. But that did not change God's heart. Israel was still God's treasured possession. But that did not mean that God wanted Israel to feel superior to the world around them. They were special because God chose them for a specific purpose, to show the world that the Lord is God and to call them into a relationship with him. God's heart has always been to restore every part of his creation and he still calls his people to join him in this work. These sections of the Bible often seem dry to us today, often seem dry to us today but what is their relevance to us today? When we read the New Testament, however, Jesus explained that he fulfilled the Old Testament law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5.17 And it's no longer binding on us as Christians. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. 
And again in Galatians 5.18 we read, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So this means we should not simply read the law and directly apply it to our lives. At the same time, we cannot discard it or consider it meaningless. The law gives us insight into the character of God and his intention for his people. First we read Apostle Paul in Romans 7 and 7 about the law and sin. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, you shall not covet. So the law reveals our sin. But how do we get rid of our sin permanently? Everything we've been saying about the Old Testament sacrificial system finds its culmination in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The sacrifices that Israel offered on a regular basis laid the groundwork for the coming of Jesus. When he arrived, the full significance of the sacrificial system finally came into view. And if we read in Hebrews 9, uh, beginning at verse 11, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And continuing in verse 24, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself and again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with blood that is not his own. Otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people were destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, to but bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And so the festivals in the Pentateuch are foreshadows of Jesus Christ. Passover, Jesus' crucifixion as the Lamb of God. First fruits, the resurrection. Pentecost, the birth of the church. The Day of Atonement, the one day that the High Priest could enter the Holy of Holies, but now with the veil torn down when Christ was crucified, we can all boldly approach the throne of God. It still leaves the Feasts of Trumpets and Tabernacles remaining, leaving many to believe that they correspond to Jesus' return and the Millennial Reign, the Old Testament foreshadowing the New. And how do we relate to the law today? Jesus has done away with the sacrificial laws. The dietary laws, although they may be medically beneficial, Jesus said in Matthew 15, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. We no longer need circumcision as a sign of the covenant. In Galatians 5, 2 through 6, we read, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And with regards to the Sabbath, in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul declares, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Similarly, Romans 14, 5 states, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. These scriptures make it clear that for the Christian, Sabbath-keeping is a matter of spiritual freedom, not a command from God. 
Sabbath keeping is an issue on which God's word instructs us not to judge each other. Sabbath keeping is a matter about which each Christian needs to be fully convinced in his or her own mind. Jesus has given us a higher standard than the law. In the Sermon on the Mount, starting in Matthew 22, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then with a series of sayings, you have heard, but I tell you, Jesus set a higher standard for us. For example, Matthew 5 and 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is it answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, you will be in danger of the fire of hell. You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have said that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. The deeper question is this, what has priority in our lives? Is Christ really first, or do we put ourselves and our own desires first? Make sure Christ is first in your life, and then ask him to guide you. What standards are we to observe? Romans 12, 1-2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. Part of that living sacrifice is to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives that encompasses the Old Testament moral law. In Galatians 5 we read, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Most Christians today understand that Jesus' death on the cross paid for our sins and allowed us to have a relationship with God. But we rarely consider that Jesus' death was a combination of a larger story of sin and sacrifice that develops throughout the Old Testament. Only when we understand the Old Testament sacrifices can we see how the Old and New Testaments dovetail perfectly into one amazing story. Jesus didn't decide on a whim that the problem of sin be could be solved by dying on a cross. The Old Testament sacrificial system demanded a sacrifice for sin, and Jesus offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. Without the book of Leviticus, we wouldn't know that. So let us now just give thanks for Jesus Christ, our ultimate sacrifice, and our Lord and Savior. There was quite a bit of things that stood out to me in my spirit. Uh, first of all, the laws of God, which still stands. No one can add or take away. And 
God is holy and he's calling all of us back unto holiness. Uh, another very good point was uh, in the days of the prophets, we saw where there had to be a sacrificial lamb and the high priests were the ones that who, who stood between man and sin and God. But uh, grateful today that we can call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He already paid the price for us. So I, I give God thanks and praise for the extended grace and the mercy and the sacrificial um, life that Jesus had paid on the cross. And the blood that he shed still has power to continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and all unholiness. So in our daily lives, being grateful to what our Heavenly Father has given unto us with his unconditional love for us, it's just to give him thanks in advance for everything, but especially for allowing Jesus to come to pay a price for the sins, known and unknown, even goes back to our forefathers who committed sin because his word says the sin passed from the third and the fourth generation. But I thank uh, my Heavenly Father for the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to stand and truly believe what God's word is saying and his laws will forever be what it says. He is holy, he's righteous, and he's calling us back where we should be in the kingdom of God. And that is the representative of Jesus Christ and ambassadors for his kingdom. And I know today that I know I've been blessed, that you have been blessed, being mindful of what God's word has already said and is saying to us even right now today and will forever be here available for us because he alone, he rules supreme and he is God and he will forever be the great I am that I am who loves you daily. In the name of Jesus, I thank him. So today we conclude our teachings on the third book of the Bible, which is Leviticus. And I pray that you've been blessed also and you are receptive and your hearts were open to what God was saying to you. Just know that he loves you dearly and he's awaiting for you to come back to him. Amen. Amen.